and this can be built over time, starting from before getting to a leadership position. It is important to note that you become a leader before you acquire a leadership position. That is the way it should be. The leadership in you will be identified well before you think you are one. Leadership is a skill. It is something you learn, grow into and eventually become. It is not a position. Becoming an office bearer does not make one a leader. <clears throat> if you are a leader, you can still influence the lives of millions, even without a title. There are certain qualities that you can develop over time in order to hone your leadership skills and excel. They are the ones I choose to call tools that should be present in your toolkit as a leader. Without them, you probably will not make it. And the cliche is true. If the only tool you have in your toolbox is a hammer, all problems will look like nails. Thus, you do not want to have limited tools. The beauty is that you have a choice to possess all the basic tools. They may include and not limited to the following, and I pass to someone else. Otiano Paul Peter, kindly, Mr. Chairman. Emotional intelligence. This, I would say, in simple terms, is the ability to think and act rationally irrespective of your feelings and to be able to know when, where, and how to wisely employ the various types of emotions. A leader must learn to separate emotions from logic. When it comes to decision making, a leader must operate more on the logic modes than emotional modes. Decisions made on logical grounds are more sober and accurate. Decisions made on the basis of emotions like anger, happiness, love, or hatred are more detrimental and regrettable over time. The most important idea is to learn the various types of emotions that you have, their pros and cons, then know how to appropriately relate or deal with them. Emotional caution is more important for one's success than the intelligence quotient. Gujan Baj. A classic case is the biblical story of Herod who in the spirit of drunkenness, joy and love, made a decision to reward his daughter after she displayed an excellent dance on his birthday with anything she ever would ask for. Shock on the king. The daughter asked for the head of John the Baptist. King Herod regretted his words, but could not recant them. You probably have seen, you probably have seen leaders getting angry in public. It is not a pleasant scene. It leaves people wondering why, while others, while others feel entertained. The question is not whether a leader gets angry. The question is what makes him or her angry and how he or she handles that feeling. If a leader is weak, minor things will arc him or her to the detriment of his or her reputation. This would further eat into his or her influence. A leader must therefore learn to control his or her emotions effectively because as a leader, people trust your words and take those words to their hearts without much digestion. 
your word will either give them hope or disillusionment. You do not have to cheat people or pretend about something. You are still the one to judge whether disillusionment is necessary and when hope is a good thing to give. Being a leader, you must take charge of your feelings and appropriately choose which feelings you want to generate in your orchestra. Most actions are only achieved if a feeling is involved and thus the reason you must, uh, proper, you, you must have proper discernment of situations. Something that can only happen if you stay rational and thus able to sagaciously decide which actions to take or which words to use in order to inspire specific emotions that beget certain actions in your orchestra. <clears throat> no in-betweens. There are parts of the world where water transport is still not just the only available option, but also the most preferred choice. They say if you travel by water, there are only two options in case of an accident. You are either completely dead or completely safe. There are no in-betweens like injury. That's nothing to fear. In fact, these people who fear any other mode of transport because of their minds, they can only see road accidents and huge casualties. It was a strange philosophy I came across. It made me realize quite early how differently people perceive things. I learned that you may look at the same object or situation and see completely different things, which end up inspiring different responses. As a leader, this is very important to understand. Otherwise, you will misjudge people and unnecessarily hurt their feelings. Remember, people will forget what you tell them, but not how you made them feel. It is how you make them feel that influences their loyalty to you. I was one day traveling from one side of the lake to the other. It was the shortest route, the cheapest as well. No direct road transport was feasible and thus I had no choice. I was coming from my grandma's, grandma's funeral. Together with my youngest brother, we were coming back at the other side of the lake. A heavy storm was seriously gathering. Um, was a heavy storm was seriously gathering. The engine boat was extremely full. I had never seen a boat so full that that no space was left. People were terribly squeezed. The police officers were, be, were busy taking statistics. I was both afraid and perturbed. Instead of controlling the number of people boarding the boat, they were only busy taking records. I pondered, this action must be meant for accurate statistics in case of an accident. Why not pre prevent it in the first place? I was as sure as death that it would rain cats and dogs while we were aboard, while we, we, while we are aboard. These were open boats without roofs. It will not be easy to gauge the degree of possible damage, but as I had said, there are only two possibilities in the scene. One is either dead or completely safe. My heart was pounding. I was obviously not feeling re ready to die. I kept calm though. How could I show panic? Yet I had my little brother whose faith completely depended on mine. As the journey continued, I kept looking back and forth back to evaluate the distance already covered from the shores of origin in case I needed to swim back, forward to evaluate the remaining distance to our destination in case I had to swim forward. Either choice will depend on which shore would appear near than the other, back or forward. My hopes were pretty diminished at some point, concluding it will not be possible whatsoever to reach any of the beaches by swimming by swimming alone because we had almost reached middle. I could see nothing else except mountains in the horizons. At such hours, you surrender your faith and hope to him who is able to rescue you, your God. It then started to rain crazily, crazily and we had to use some large polythene curtains to cover ourselves from both the pounding of water by the strong wind and the heavy downpour. The boat was not steady at all. Being pounded violently by the waves, it, it 
It kept bouncing up and down under the wild tides, scooping water. People had to clear the water very fast for the boats to remain afloat. Most women were singing solemn worship songs as others prayed aloud. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Some people could not stop crying and cursing. All manner of things happen at the face of danger. Despite all this pressure around me, I chose to stay calm because of the position I held in the heart of my little brother. To him, I was everything he needed to be safe. And in case of anything, he was the only burden I had. I had to rescue him. Being just about eight years older then, he had not learned how to swim in a lake yet. Surely, he was my biggest worry. I knew I would survive. But with, but with him, but with him, matters were more complicated. Because of my calmness, he was calm as well. He felt assured of his safety. The boat finally succumbed to the furious tides and split. People had no choice but to kiss the water. The captain increased the speed to rescue us because it was just about a kilometer or so to the shore. But we soon had to be in water, just for a short distance. We were lucky to be completely safe that day. I learned a lot about leadership that day. The captain had to stay focused and show no sign of panic. It would have sent a great panic and that would have been disastrous. I had to display the same for the sake of my brother. You have to do the same for the sake of your orchestra. That is what we call emotional intelligence, learning to stay calm amidst of a storm and still make a rational judgment, giving hope when giving hope when it is it is most needed staying focused on the goal excluding excluding uh -huh. confidence that assures your people your team that things are still under control the confidence that gives hope and makes your team keep trying harder. The confidence that creates contentment he, despite huge challenges. It is during challenging times that your strength of character is going to be stretched to the limits. How you behave in times of crisis, how you behave when business is bad, or when the numbers in your orchestra are dwindling, how you would behave when you are extremely vexed by someone, even your spouse, while verily will will very will verily determine the course of your leadership and the legacy you will build. Systems and rules are guidelines. Leadership is lifeline. Jana Kashola. Okay, so uh, even as I uh, welcome all those who have joined us, as we are reading this, there's something that's that has just hit me. Uh, I've been in I've been in a very tricky situation for the last maybe four or five months, I've been in a tricky situation. I've been having so much going on in my life emotionally. And so somehow I have been emotionally unhealthy. And you see, at the end of the day, I'm still leading an organization. I still have a team to lead. And these young ladies are looking up to me. So if they look up to me and I do not have hope, it's like I am giving up. They're definitely going to lose hope and some of them are going to give up. So I had to, give, to, to, to keep on having a brave face. I had to keep on smiling. Like I used to come in the office as if nothing is going on. Same. Mostly this time of when, when COVID was so much and everything, my goodness, you're just coming to the office and thinking, okay, so, we need to pay rent, we need to do this and that. I have these girls here, what am I supposed to do? You get me. I also have my life and everything. What am I supposed to do? And these girls are looking up to you. So at the end of the day, you just have to be strong. You have to be, to put your emotions together at the even um, before them. So I'll come to the office, do everything that I'm supposed to do and everything, and then they go home. I'll call my director and cry, 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 cry. But the next day when they come to the office, by then they would look at me and at, at some point they, tell, they told me, I really encouraged them because they felt I was going through so much heat, through so much fire. But in the face of it, I had to keep a courageous face. And then I remember scenario number two where this lady from the coast 
um, she didn't have food, she didn't have anything, and she has children. She doesn't know what to do. And I remember reading, and um, it was, I think it was also in the news, I was reading, and this lady used to take stones, put them on a sovereign, light fire, and start cooking them. So then her children has it in mind that there is food that is coming, but there's no food. And when people asked her why she was doing that, she was like, I had to be courageous for my children. Like there is no way my children are going to lose it because I have lost it. So I had to put on a courageous face and do what I was supposed to do. Even though I was boiling stones, most of the times these children slept even before they were eat. They, they even before they ate or anything because they thought there is food, but the food has delayed. So mostly they slept. So guys, I want you to tell me your pickup point for today. I'll start with you, Dr. Eda Tatu. Yes, thank you very much. Um, this topic of emotional intelligence is very important, especially for leaders. And because parenting is one of my uh, favorite Ish, uh, issues of, of helping people with, then with parents, it's extremely important that parents be, have emotional intelligence because um, all the problems in society, 99% of problems in society can be traced back to the family unit. And the, the way your parents behaved in times of crisis and the way they handled their emotions is very much related to how young people uh, relate in, in relationships. But since it's at the subconscious level, in therapy, we call it bringing what is subconscious to the conscious mind. Because before you get married, you should at least do minimum of five sessions of therapy because you have absorbed all your parents' emotional uh, behavior and uh, on, on both sides. And so that some, if it was positive, then well and good. If it was negative, then that needs to be purged and you become aware of it. And uh, once you are aware of it, then you're able to control it. So um, in this case, we have something called an equation, which is E over I or I over E. People who are not in control of their emotions have E over I. Emotions rule the intelligence. And people who are in control of the emotions have I over E. That is their intelligence is the one that controls their emotions. And these are the ones that really go far in life. And it's very true about the, the, the leader being supposed to be calm because when the leader uh, loses it, then everybody loses it. Uh, just a slight correction um, for Herod, Herod, in the case of Herod, that was his stepdaughter. You know, Herod had married his brother's wife and that was an illegal, that was an adulterous relationship. And his wife came with a baby called Herod, uh, yeah, Herodias. She had a daughter from her, it was, it was actually his niece as well as his stepdaughter. And uh, yeah, so when you make decisions, when you're extremely happy, you'll make promises like that, which uh, you're not able to fulfill later. We also tell people, yeah, when you commit suicide, sorry, we call it dying by suicide, not committing suicide. Suicide is a permanent uh, decision for a temporary problem. And you leave all your family members uh, devastated for the rest of their lives. So never make these decisions when you're extremely sad or extremely happy. Um, yeah, always calm down and get to a level where you're able to rationalize and make the best decision based on informed consent, informed choices. Thanks. Thank you so much. Power Monday, what was going through your mind? I know this emotional intelligence topic is really, uh, is really your thing. Very many times you keep on telling me emotional, being emotionally healthy, you have to be emotionally healthy and everything. So what was going through your mind when you're writing this particular uh, script, Power Monday? 
Thank you, uh, Nail. Uh, and good to see all of you. Uh, I know a, a number of you came in when we were almost done with the text. But uh, I will start from the point of uh, leadership toolkit. You know, most, most people don't think about what does it really entail? Being, you know, what are some of the tools that will make us be able to navigate the stormy seas of leadership and uh, be able to deliver that which we should? And uh, we've also mentioned there that, that people become leaders before they get into leadership position. You know, a lot of people wait for leadership position, then they become leaders. And they think, if I am made the chairman, then I am, I, I've become a leader. And sometimes I think uh, people just find themselves, or they are just pushed because enough leaders do not want to, or are really not willing to take the role. You know, most leaders are leaders, yes, but they always want to give some room for other people to uh, take up the roles and uh, practice as they guide them from behind. And uh, in some scenarios, you realize that people get into leadership position, positions and then it gets into their heads. And uh, therefore they start, uh, they, they, they do not have what it takes to hold such positions. And that's why we say power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, with that in mind, it's always important to know that as a leader, uh, we are always somewhat above the rest in terms of focus. People look more unto you. You are like sitting on a mountain. Everyone is able to see how you behave to inform how they behave. Right now, uh, most of us are hearing this story of Centum uh, and uh, the investment and all these stories. And uh, by the end of the day, the way the CEO behaves in that organization will most uh, times determine how the staff will behave and uh, whether they will be assured that things are going right, uh, things will be right, or they want to exit. And that is the way leadership is. We must keep growing in our decision making, which is all that leaders do. In every situation, in every aspect, every moment a leader is always making decisions. The question is, are we making decisions based on what realities are around us, how scared we are, or are we still making sober decisions based on where we want to be, based on the mission? of the organization based on the values, based on uh, the, uh, the vision and something like that. And so I've learned that, you know, it's a reality that activity is only generated by emotions. We've got to have sufficient degree of emotion to catapult some movement. But uh, we, we may end up using emotions wrongly. And that's why, as a leader, if we do not know how to check, how to gauge our emotions and how to select, at this moment, I want to generate this emotion in my people. At this moment, I want to generate this emotion. At this moment, I want to use this particular emotion. At this moment, I want to use this particular emotion. It becomes a problem. And remember, our emotions also determine a lot about our results. The results that we get on our day today activities, whether it's business, whether it's a, a, a job, or it's a family life, our day to day results are largely determined by our state of emotion, including our uh, prayers, what we pray for, what we visualize and things like that. We are driven, we are emotional beings, actually. We are driven by our emotions, they determine what we are able to see, what we are able to figure out, they determine our activities and things like that. Including savings, somebody will save money, Melvin will uh, talk about money things. Save money depending on which emotions they have. Others save because they are driven by fear. Fear of loss, something might get lost, something might get terrible and I need to have something to uh, go, go uh, to look into, something like that. So 
if we are able to choose and we should be able to choose our emotions intelligently that at this particular just like somebody driving at this particular time i can put this gear i can increase the speed i can lower the speed i can turn like this and that is the way it is so each and every one of us must keep learning and mastering how to make use of our emotions in that particular text i've talked about a story that is dear to me and uh, that time uh, I, remember i was writing this thing more than almost 30 years later yeah more than 20 years uh, around 25 there about but it was still clear in my mind how this situation was and that was not the only time i was traveling by boat uh, yeah because thereafter i did the same probably it's also written somewhere in the book i'm not very sure but that was an a defining moment i knew that if i start displaying fear my brother will definitely cry will definitely show have panic and things like that but despite all that was happening around us and i stayed calm he was calm that's the way your team will be i remember i i have i have loved giving this uh, example a number of times when i was uh, uh, still employed uh, in a, a company occasionally i would meet the general manager the head of the organization in the elevators in the lift and he looked stressed all the times and let me tell you that reflected on how most of us were you look at the leader is stressed you feel like things are really terrible maybe this is not the right place to be thank you okay karibu sana um the bible says that when you when you if your strength fails at the day of adversary then you did you have very small strength so then the bible or god or rather not the bible god expects us to be stronger at the time of the adversary because remember our hands are pro, like the people in the army or kdf are trained for war so we are not trained just to be there we are trained for the time of adversary when that time comes when that time when your emotions are everywhere when that time when nothing is making sense like in this story where obvi is saying that he had to keep a brave face that time is when his leadership skills were being tested that time was when you have now to to come up into your elements Melvin Glima how are you I'd love to hear your contribution to the same Yeah this topic of uh, of emotional in in intelligence is a bit of a confounder for me uh because uh, emotional uh, I, I mean your emotional response uh it can work for you or against you and uh, my own personal experience is that uh, uh it tends to work against me because i'm re reactive uh i'm reactive and i allow my emotions to take over from me and yet at the same time decision making is supposed to be a uh what do you call it a very logical process so uh, i i like the author's uh, uh calm uh, control of his emotions and that is something that i would like to put into my own personal toolkit tell you that's what i wanted to say uh and noel okay thank you so much morris or mondi how are you what's your take off for today Not sure he's here. Take the keme. Karibu sana. Okay, Maurice on to you. Okay, thank you so much. And sorry for getting a bit later the uh, gone for morning mass I was rush, just rushing back to get the talk. So I had read part of the section on uh, of the book and I was just contemplating on uh, the decision by King Herod. and uh, i realized there are two sides of it one he made a, a decision or he made an offer in that moment of uh, excitement 
And uh, while he thought that, in my opinion, while he thought that he had made a promise that he could not break, I, I think when you start applying emotional intelligence, you will have gone ahead and find out why is my daughter asking for this? Because the daughter was also making this after being influenced by the mother. So as a leader, sometimes before making a decision, because th that was the first decision he made. I mean, he offered that he will give the daughter anything she asked for, except maybe the, uh, the kingdom itself, but she could give her, he could give half of it. So sometimes as a leader, you could also, before making a second kind of mistake, you need to inquire a bit because this girl has come and has asked you that I want the head of John the Baptist in front of all the people. And uh, this reminded me of uh, a lesson I learned from one of my bosses a couple of years ago. And uh, what he taught me that if I want to ask something and I feel it is a bit embarrassing, I should not ask him in front of people because that is almost like blackmail. And uh, more times he will reject it because if you, I, I asked him something in, the, in front of people, maybe in a big meeting, it will appear as if uh, I'm exercising power over him and yet is, it is him with the boss. So I learned that the best way of getting my, a positive answer was to check, to, to, under, to notice or rather when this boss is uh, in a calm moment when he's in the office and I go there and I close the door and I explain whatever I'm looking, I'm asking for and we discuss. So I think, uh, having that gift or other knowledge of emotional intelligence is two ways. It's not just about the leader, but even the people who are in an office. So, and I could, even the story that you were giving earlier, uh, my sister, about how you're managing the calm in your office. You see, the way you are portraying yourself, it gave the people who are, you are leading some sort of confidence. So this topic is very timely, including the story about uh, the storm that was taking place on that day. And this reminds me again of the, the reading that was in church yesterday about the storm that was uh, when the, Jesus and the disciples were crossing over the river to the other side, and then the storm came. And uh, Jesus was just sleeping there, relaxed, but all the apostles, all the disciples were afraid and they were trembling because they thought that they were going to die. So when Jesus um, woke up, or they woke him up and said, Jesus, are you not concerned that we are dying? And Jesus calmed the storm and then told them, didn't you have even a little faith? So it's just about emotional intelligence and trying to react in a calm way because Jesus, of course, is, a, is God, the son of God, so it's a special case. He was able to calm the storm. But even in our day-to-day -day leadership, how are we able to calm the storms in our lives? So that is my contribution in uh, this uh, for the discussion today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so our, our, our example, like for, for us Christians, our main example of leadership is Jesus Christ. Because at the end of the day, when Jesus Christ was on earth, he was fully man. He was fully man. He downgraded himself to be fully man. So there's another situation where Jesus has like a crusade of a thing. Let me just use the word crusade, a gathering of 4,000 men. And the guys say then the guys are hungry. And Jesus is like, okay, these guys are hungry. So his disciples had a shortcut. What do we do? Let them tell them to go and find food. You see, this is like, no, 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 no. So Jesus tells them, no, the disciples say, in this crowd, there's only five fish and two loaves of bread. No, two loaves of bread, two, five loaves of bread and two fish. And what did Jesus do? Jesus was, okay, bring that one. That is what we are going to use. He kept his, he, he, like he kept calm. And then now you see himself again in the garden of Gethsemane where Peter chopped off someone's ear. Like this guy is going to die. I mean, we are saying our leader is going to die, but our leader is so calm. He is so calm. It's like, it's very okay. I'm just thinking, wait a minute. That, that one is on another level altogether. But what does Peter do? Peter decided to chop off his ear. I think 
Peter was really growing in this emotional and intelligence thing. He started Mahali Ukochini and then he kept on climbing up. So Peter decides to chop off one of the soldiers ear. And what does Jesus do? Jesus, Jesus um, performs another miracle and he, and he fixes the ear again. So, but in all this, we see that Jesus has, had kept his calm. Jesus was, was not in a hurry. He was not making decisions based on his emotions. The wrong time to make decisions is when you're emotionally. Either you're angry or you're happy or don't, at that time, do not make decisions. Mm -mm. Don't make decisions because they can really mess you up. <laughs> Let me share this joke. So we were in a certain church and that pastor was telling us, ladies, stop chewing sugar cane. Why? Because when you chew sugar cane, I mean, you're so busy on the sugar cane. If someone at that time comes, the wrong person, and he proposes, you will be like, okay, it's a, yes, 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 yes. Because the sugar cane has given you so much sugar, your emotions are up there. <laughs> you even do not know what is happening. So girls, ladies, do not choose sugar cane. You might end up saying yes to a man that you're supposed to say no to. <laughs> Patrick, I need to hear your mind on the same. Mr. Patrick, I'm sure you're there. Yeah, I'm there. I, I love the analogy of the sugar cane story. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, I, although I joined in uh, quite late, but uh, on once again, this topic on emotional intelligence is very interesting. Reason being, many people think that uh, when you have a high IQ, uh, uh, it, 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 it uh, uh, what do I say? It corresponds with a higher EQ. So we tend to think that since my IQ is very high, I'm also emotionally intelligent. But on the contrary, it does not work that way. So we do not uh, we do not even take time to harness our emotional intelligence. We only think it's a thing of that affects other people, but it does not affect us. As you are saying, when you are when you're on the extreme, either very happy or very angry, making decisions will really affect you because uh, many people do not uh, tend to think that way because they think that uh, it is me who is making a decision and the, regardless of my state, I can, I can make it at any time. But it reaches a point then they wonder like, hey, how comes, how comes uh, I made a wrong decision? Why didn't I think or why, what was I thinking when I was making that decision? Not remembering that emotionally, we, uh, we, we emotionally, our, our emotional intelligence levels are not the same. Some are very low, some are very high. So depending on how you yourself have grown towards enhancing your emotional intelligence, then it is really, it is really, it really affects your decision and it really affects who as a, as a person you are. For the, uh, a good example, the way the story of Jesus, Jesus was very calm as compared to the disciples. Jesus was the one who was being killed. The disciples were the followers. But who was more anxious? The disciples. So if as a leader, you exercise your emotional intelligence, the people you are leading, they will be able to read that. As they read that, then they will say, ah, if our leader is calm and we are undergoing the storm, then it makes sense for us to reciprocate the same or to follow the same so that we also help the leader or back up the leader in making a wise decision so that at the end of the day, we navigate through the storm. I think that's my take. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Faith, I really do not want to finish the Zoom meeting without you saying a word on the same. If you are here, Faith. Okay, no stress is here. But parting short, okay, no Paul Peter, back to you. Yeah, uh, two things. Uh, one, let's not think of uh, emotional intelligence only in terms of decision making.
but also in terms of what we utter. Uh, yeah, the moment you pronounce something, it becomes a law. In fact, in the abbot, in, in the monks, uh, whatever abbot uttered yeah, <laughs> becomes a law. If president utters something today, president of Kenya utters something today that uh, uh, such like people should be killed on the spot, that becomes the headline. And that is the situation where uh, Herod was uh, going back to the same story that these people, the, the, the idea of bringing in the, the, the head of John the Baptist was very logical. The Herodias knew this guy doesn't want me to stay here. And he's being kept in prison, he's not being killed, he continues to speak anyway. Uh, so this was the opportune moment. And they knew, they knew very well that the king, having uttered this in public, he's got to keep it. And because we are leaders, our words are weightier, they are heavier. And we, we spoke about this at the beginning of the book because our words become our bonds. So what we utter during these times of emotions become something that a monkey we've got to keep, a monkey we've got to take care of, you see? And that is the way it works. So we've got to uh, think in terms of what do we do? What do we say? What decisions do we make? Uh, at one point, I was taught that uh, before you utter something and you, you are very angry, somebody has really uh, uh, done you some harm or something, you are annoyed, you may want to count first. Breathe in, breathe out, count one to ten. <laughs> then you will start thinking soberly, you see. And uh, that's the way it is. If we just react, if we just uh, start speaking, you realize that word one word leads to another and a quarrel ensues and what becomes is a fight it's people get, even getting physical so and that is the problem we have today where people do not have a lot of uh, emotional control they cannot control their emotions that's why people are fighting that's why people are getting into injuries uh, gender violence and all these that we are talking about it's all driven by our emotions, which we are not able to keep under check. And so it's good that we get to be sure, what is it that I am about to say? Is it right? Is it like, I, I like, I love talking about our, uh, the Rotary four-way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? Will it be beneficial? You see, if we subject our emotion, our activity, our words towards uh, uh, those checks, then we are going to be quite fine. We don't have to feel right. We just have to control our thinking, our activities, so that we are able to act soberly. And this is a subject we are going to continue to discuss uh, next week. Otherwise, thanks for all the contributions. Noel, actually. OK, thank you so, so much. There's something that, uh, that I learned when I'm so angry, so very angry, and I want to tell someone something, and then I just take someone who told me I am a, I am a master in texting. I can write, I can write and write and write a text, a very long text, and then I send. So there's something I learned. I learned when I am very angry, I text and then I don't send it. I save it as a draft. So I rest like for, I take my time, maybe 30 minutes or what, and then I go back and read that text, you see. And when I go back and read that text, I realize that, I, I realize that um, most of the things that I have texted, some are very, some are very hurtful, you see. And some do not even showcase Christ. They do not dispense Christ. They're going to break the other person. You get me. So when you're very angry, when you're very happy, do not make decisions. Do not text people. Don't. Just take your time. Please. Relax. As the endi mali popote. Sawa sawa. Now what are endi anywhere? They're just there. So thank you guys for, for joining us today. Thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. Make sure that you are warm. Yeah? Just make sure that you're warm. Make sure that you're drinking you're, you're drinking warm water or tea or something, but just keep yourselves warm. 
And I mean, you're blessed. I'm, I'm sure by now you know you are blessed. And there's nothing that is going to change the fact that you're blessed, no matter the situations, no matter what you're going through, no matter what people say, you are blessed. Keep on telling yourself that you're blessed. So thank you so much. We meet every Monday, same time. The link is the same. So do not wait for any other link. Just use the same link. You can join in as early as 7 a.m. for networking. And then if you want this book, the physical book, this Making of a Symphony Orchestra, if you want the book, kindly get in touch with Oteno Paul Peter. He'll give you the book because it's a very good book. And guys, we are on chapter five. I feel when we are done with the book, we start the book again. <laughs> but anyway, thank you for coming today, Dr. Edda.